Start with the star. Are there any NLP people here already? Okay, a few. So I apologize to you people in advance. This is a little bit of a quick shot through this topic, but uh, hopefully practical for people. Um, I also have to begin with an apology. This is the NLP side of stuff, so I don't get to talk about generative design for JPL landers or anything like that. That's another department. Uh, it's always great to be reminded of, the co of your cooler cousins when by someone else in the company. <laughs> but uh, hopefully, hopefully people will nonetheless be interested. How many people have heard of Autodesk? Excellent. Some seems to be two kinds of crowds. One group of crowds who look at me in stony silence and the other half who uh, know, what they know a little bit about us. So very briefly, Autodesk is the company that builds, uh, whose customers build almost everything. We have uh, almost any project that involves uh, large-scale construction or uh, 3D modeling or um, uh, a lot of M&E these days, so a lot of animation, 3D animation, those sorts of things, VR, AR, 3D printing, all that sort of stuff. Our software is a big component of what people do to make that work. And increasingly, we're involved in what we call the future of making. So we're fascinated by this concept of how machine-assisted uh, um, design is changing the way people work, changing the way people create everything these days. So one of the conversations that my colleagues and I are having a lot of the time with design professionals is what happens when you're not just faced with a blank page anymore? What happens if you, the sort of experience that you have uh, when you use Gmail and it starts to auto-compose to the point where you wonder whether or not you really need to be sitting at the keyboard anymore <laughs> happens to our uh, architects and our engineers and our friends like that so that we can do things like optimize layouts, we can do things like grow in an evolutionary fashion, all of those sorts of things. So that's the cool part of Autodesk and that's the exciting stuff and we have a global um, we have a global customer base in extraordinarily complicated uh, um, tasks uh, engaged in real serious projects and important work and that's where my team comes in. So what we do is that we deal with when things go wrong with our product, which doesn't happen very often I'm required to say, but do when it does happen the agents themselves uh, need to be able to help people. And the key thing for us and the thing that makes this such a fascinating environment for me as someone involved in NLP is that we have here an expert user base. We have a group of people who have immense ability in what they do. They're engineers, they're designers, they're animators, they're architects, they're physicists, they're anything you can possibly think of. And sometimes the problems that they have look like the problem on the right there, which is that they're doing a finite element analysis or they're doing a continuous flow um, analysis of a car body and answering a question about how our model works or answering a question about how that system works requires an immensely capable agent in the back end as well. So we have employment, we employ people who are very, very smart about how their products work. That means that their time is extremely valuable. That means that, for example, with one of the projects a bit like this, there was someone doing some work on, um, uh, it was aerospace, drag, an drag analysis for uh, an, aer an aerospace structure. It took two days for our um, HPC cluster to just resolve the code before they could even begin to debug it. So there's an investment of time there that's super important. On the other side, we also get all the queries that are like, I can't find the download on the website, I've lost my password, I can't remember what's going on. And the difference between those things is how is everything that we are involved in improving as a data science team. How do we make sure that our customer gets a response in 15 minutes if we can answer their question in 15 minutes? And how can we make sure that a customer gets to talk to the one person in the world who can answer their question if that's who needs to be talked to? And as an NLP practitioner, as someone who's working in language, this is a uniquely wonderful way to work on things because truly you don't get this opportunity to work in such a broad base of highly domain-specific terminology very often. So fundamentally, what is natural language processing? Um, I like to think of it in a very concrete way. How do we take a set of words, represent their concepts, their context, and their meaning in a fashion that is usable by a computer? And this can be very simple. This can literally be we're just going to match individual tokens separated by spaces for languages that have spaces, and we're just going to say how often did the word angry get used? And that's predictive to some extent. But then we know a lot about how humans communicate. We know that humans do not communicate in a very straightforward fashion. If language were purely an, uh, uh, an information exchange approach or an information exchange medium, a language would be much more pedestrian. But language is an attention game, right? Language is about 
maintaining the attention of the crowd or maintaining the attention of the person you're speaking to. So you pun, you refer, you use uh, acronyms, you use metaphors, you do all sorts of games to try and keep people's attention. You wave your hands about, you use people's names, uh, all of those things, Alexi. Uh, <laughs> And what we're doing there is that we're playing an attention game, which means that for computational purposes is extremely difficult. For example, in customer support, sometimes we get a customer that says, this is not working and I am angry about it. But very often we just get a lot of capital letters and we have to infer that that's a problem. And so the same kind of things happen. How do we go from this very simple counting of individual words, counting of individual tokens, counting of individual uh, uh, section, segments into something that actually represents somewhat the meaning of language. So there's this very nice book that's been out recently called um, Because Internet, Understanding the New Rules of Language, and it's a kind of an analysis of some of the ways in which we've changed the way we speak because of Twitter, because of Facebook, of course, uh, because of Amazon and everyone else, and how they all shape the way we change, the, the way we describe things, the way we use words. Prime has changed meaning very recently in a substantial way. We used to use a good example of tablet, which used to mean uh, if you're from the UK and Ireland, meant the pills that you take as medicine, or it meant the thing with the commandments on it. And now, <laughs> does not mean those things mostly. Most often, when you talk about tablet, you're talking about a, what are they called, fire tablet? Is that what I'm supposed to talk about here? <laughs> <laughs> um, but the critical thing is this. Even when we look at something incoherent to the outsider, and let me tell you, some of those uh, complicated aerospace diagram things. It's about 17 hours of Wikipedia browsing just to understand every word in the sentence. Even in those situations, our customers use a coherent model. They themselves show statistical relevance in what they say. They say things in patterns and we can use the power of computation to reflect those patterns. And that is the entire thing that we're trying to do here. And in practical terms, that was what we're interested in. So the rest of this talk, I'm going to be very down to earth. I'm going to talk about how you actually go from this problem of having a blob of text that you're worried about into something that you can operationalize using relatively state-of-the-art <laughs> technology. And the answer is you use PyTorch, you use SageMaker, and you use a little bit of uh, manual annotation. And when I say a little bit, I mean a lot. But that's uh, part of the process. So the first task that you have is very rarely do you get your data in a nice clean format in NLP. I think of all of our, of all the domains that we have to deal with, and natural language processing is sometimes the most difficult because in practical terms inside companies, no one is thinking about the poor natural language technology people when they're thinking about storing data in a database. They're just putting it in a grid somewhere and you have to s try and remove it. So this is a kind of a neutralized typical example of the sort of support ticket that we might have to deal with. We get some metadata that we don't care about, and then we get the actual text from our customer, and we need to do a couple of things. We need to recognize that core text. And for example, if you get a thread of a dozen emails where it's like, re, 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 I hate your company, and then at the bottom, you have to extract that last piece of text from it. That's the sort of thing that everyone thinks is a one hour job and then turns into an entire PhD. And what we do with it is, we then have to think about what's inside there. Okay, so. In this situation, Revit has been the, the tool that's mentioned. It's one of our design tools. The customer has put in a serial number that we don't want to spread around, so we're going to replace <laughs> that because that's a sensitive piece of information. And often we get typos. We get variants in language. We often don't have um, native English speakers where people are typing stuff or have clearly Google translated it. We also have to deal with that sort of thing because that doesn't always uh, produce the data properly. So the first thing you have to do is think in terms of pipelines. You think about the fact that you have raw data, raw text stored somewhere, and periodically you have to strip out everything down to this piece of text that you're interested in, and then sometimes you have the advantage that you can look for specific tokens that you know are unambiguous. <clears throat> if you work in Microsoft Office, this example will anger you because while it's relatively easy to recognize Revit, it's very difficult to recognize Word, and even harder to recognize Excel as tokens that are not something otherwise used or other with other context. So my lesson is, if you work with product teams, tell them to make easily recognizable tokens for the names of your products. Um, NLP pipelines, uh, TorchText does some very nice ones. Spacey does some extremely good ones. There's a lot of tools out there that will help you to do that. But ultimately, for our team, the key challenge is this. How do we help our customers ask the questions they need answers in their own words? 
because the hardest challenge for a lot of companies is they have a lot of documentation, they have a lot of organization, they have a lot of websites, they have all of this information, but they think about it in terms of how it reflects their organizational structure and their people's way of thinking about things and their people's way of organizing things. And there, is, there hasn't been that shrink wrap test. There hasn't been that thing where you get someone who is technically able but not aware to try and actually find something on the website. And anyone who's had to use a restaurant website ever knows exactly how difficult this is. And so we as a team are interested in three things. We're interested in using the state of the art technology because that's the best way to get things done and it's the most fun. We want to do it rapidly because we don't have the luxury of spending a lot of time on the research of this. We want to get stuff into production fast so that we find out what's wrong with it. Because very often your model is broken, your assumptions about the, the variation of the language are gone, and every three months we change our, a lot of our language changes anyway because of the way our products evolve. And the last thing is we want to be able to share stuff, both inside our team and around with every other team as well, because it's critical for us to be able to get this results of our analysis out, to not have to redo the work every dozen a dozen times every time we have to extract this data and we do it consistently. So for us, uh, there are a couple technologies that I'd like to talk about in detail. Does anyone recognize the uh, leftmost symbol? The hugging, face. the hugging face. I still don't know why it's called that, but it's a fabulous company with a fabulous piece of technology. Hugging Face has done a great job in taking the state of the art in uh, natural language processing technology and making it available to the world. It is a net good of, of enormous size. Fast AI is a, another um, set of libraries that have um, text analytics as part of their work. It's also a course on how to learn deep learning. I think it's actually by someone who's in the Bay Area, Jeremy Howard. So uh, I will talk a little bit about Fast AI. And finally, you know, drum roll please, PyTorch, which we think is a, a particularly good way of doing these things. So why do we like PyTorch? Uh, access to research code is the number one thing. It is very easy to get quick access to what's going on. It's nice to be able to read a paper at ACL and see the code pop up on GitHub very quickly later in a platform that we understand and that we're ready to use. It has the intuitive interfaces. There's new, normally pretty much only one way to do something. I did some work as an undergraduate in Perl. Perl's whole thing was about doing it more than one way. And honestly, that was a terrible idea. <laughs> Let's just tell everyone how we should do things in one particular way. And I, we appreciate your uh, strong opinions on how to implement things because it makes life much easier. And not everyone wants to spend the day working on Rubik's Cube code. And new features. There's an immense uh, amount of code being produced, which, I mean, Brad is, I, I love that Detectron video. I have no use for it, but I keep thinking I'm going to find a way, some way to have, <laughs> maybe I'll have customers wave the box in front of the webcam and we'll identify their product that way. But that sort of stuff is very cool. And, you know, Captum we found to be very exciting. Uh, all the stuff around Pytex is very exciting and everything to do with large models is great. So, PyTorch is great. Uh, Support uh, as, a, as a topic is underloved, I feel, as a domain. I think that uh, it is one of the most interesting ones to do, and NLP is awesome. So what is a transformer? The reason that natural language processing has got so interesting in the last little while is the fact that we have a new way of thinking about uh, how to solve these problems. Uh, this all kind of started about seven years ago when uh, Thomas Mikhailov at <coughs> Google um, started a project where he was able to finally think about this idea of how do we get from words to something that is a differentiable continuous space from machine learning. And word proximity was always a difficult thing before that point because uh, concepts are associated with, with each other. We've known that since the distribution hypothesis in the 50s. But how do we actually start to get into a, into a mathematical shape, into a mathematical space that we can actually use for something smooth and learnable and differentiable like machine learning? So peri uh, over the last couple of years, we've been moving forward until the point where we get to now where uh, there was a paper in 2017 called uh, Attention is All You Need where they demonstrated that all of the work we had been doing up until now on recurrent neural networks, on uh, convolutional neural networks and all those sorts of things, this feature called attention turned out to be the most interesting part of it all. Very simply, what is attention? Attention says that I'm not just going to look at one word at a time. I'm going to look at the word and I'm going to look at everything around it. And every meaning about every sentence comes from how these words are together within the segment that I'm interested in. And I like to use the phrase, the words, uh, words of a feather flock together. So similar words appear together. Similar words appear in similar sentences in a similar way. And by that process of learning, we can understand all of the words and we can understand 
um, where, what they mean in terms of their context, in terms of their meaning, and in terms of their conceptual representation. And transformers, uh, in that sense, represent this kind of unprecedentedly large scale in doing that, where we just have more, 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 and more data. But it's also about the fact that we have this very um, off, hands-off way of dealing with the um, training task, which is that we are not supervising the task in a detailed way. We are letting the model learn the language, letting the model learn the grammar, maybe even letting the model, well, let's say maybe for the grammar, but certainly letting the model learn strong probabilities about sequences of words in a meaningful fashion. <coughs> so that gives you something that can be used for text classification, for language generation, for machine translation, for any application that you can think of, multimodal, is an increasingly interesting one, so caption generation or story generation, all those sorts of things can be done using a transformer, and you don't have to train it from scratch anymore. So when we talk about machine learning, this is what we're talking about. Uh, importantly, this stuff was mostly started in English, and with all NLP you have to discuss where is it in other languages, and we are very fortunate that the work that's been done now uh, is increasingly being done, uh, reproduced in other languages in a way that also uh, uh, represents uh, uh, progress there. Um, for example, my favorite, uh, my favorite uh, thing out there right now is one of the transformers, which I'll talk about a little bit later, is called BERT. And the French, uh, does anyone know what the French model is called? It's called Camembert or Camembert. <laughs> and uh, the Camembert model was, I think, Facebook in Paris, so they've had more time on their hands. But <laughs> um, yes, so we are getting to the point where we'll also be able to deploy these in other languages. Uh, lower, we are rapidly uh, progressing on the level of resource of languages as well. So the high resource languages like English, Chinese, French, German, Spanish, Italian are all being done very quickly. Indic languages are rapidly following along. It's very, very promising to see that. Yep. Why is it called transformer? Can, can you explain a bit more? Like what is it transform? What, what is it? I actually don't know why they called it transformers, but the key thing about this transformer is that um, what they did was instead of having a recurrent neural network where you have these, this recurrent structure that keeps feeding backwards and forwards, all you do is stack layers of attention on top of each other. So you have multiple sets of layers which are all looking at the multiple cells below them and you're composing them each time and then passing them through a feed-forward network. It's kind of like the nature of the model is transforming as it trains, right? Yeah, I, 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 I guess so. I don't know that that distinguishes it from any other model, is, you know. Well, Perhaps. In a typical image model, you're not necessarily adding new layers while you're training. You're just updating the gradients. Well, true. Uh, and I mean, it's certainly that, that might be one way to think about it. I am, um, their level of commitment to, this, to the se semantics of the naming, I don't actually, I, I, I wasn't convinced of. So I don't know much about this, but what it meant to me when I heard it is each word gets transformed by a sort of a new symbol, which is the, the weighted as you say, weighted sequence of words? Yeah, again, absolutely. It, the, you know, I, I will quibble whether or not, all, not that's all that different from other multi-layered methodologies, but you know, I, I think convolution, like word convolution is a more substantive, often a more substantial crushing of the, or transforming, but yes, in, in short, um, there's a philosophical discussion there. One interesting point that I do want to discuss about this though is that one of the things that transformers do that is intriguing is that transformers do something that humans apparently do as well, which is that they read the whole sentence, then they decide on the meaning. So attention projects both ways in BERT, right? You look at the whole sentence at once. And there's an interesting conclusion to that, which is that when we talk about writing or when we talk about language, it's a serialization of a simultaneous thought. And we know this to be true because if you have puns or if you have any sentence that ends on the dangling word, uh, it's only when you hear the last word that it makes sense. That's because we have a simultaneous thought about a language that we deserialize. And you know, it's an intriguing uh, operational proof or an evidence of a, of a way in which our minds work in terms of language. Sorry, digression. Key other point about this. Um, I just want to highlight this part here. Um, the other key point here is multi-headed self-attention. And that means that in transformers, we don't just look at the sequence of words once, we look at them multiple times in multiple separate ways. So it's almost like reading at different levels. In doing that, we get uh, um, more compositionality and we get more ability to reflect differences in subtle differences in combinations of sequences. If you want to train a model from scratch, you can do so. Uh, and our friends at PyTorch have provided the transformers module, which is rather good for that. Uh, why would you do this? 
You probably wouldn't do it if you were doing language, but if you can think of any other large number, uh, large set of sequences of repeated patterns of uh, symbols that you can recognize that you might want to look for the context of, then this is the place to be. So code, uh, genetics, um, those are the two that come to mind immediately. You can encode them with a transformer so long as you have enough base data. You need gigabytes, hundreds of gigabytes of data, but if you have that, you can attempt to do something with a transformer here, and those sorts of sequence models work as well. So, what does it look like in context? I'm going to talk about BERT, mostly because while BERT is not the most um, up-to-date of the models so uh, anymore, it is probably the one that most people will end up using because it has the best support, it has the best recognition, and it provides most of the features that you could ever want. So a BERT sentence looks a little bit like this. I can install Revit 2019, and I would highlight for you two things. One is that this is not the conventional way you would tokenize something. So we don't just split words into individual words anymore. Now what they actually do is subword tokenization. So the model has learned a set of byte sequence um, byte sequence encodings, which are high frequency combinations of letters, which it then divides words it hasn't seen before into. This allows you to avoid an out of vocabulary problem that was a huge challenge with previous approaches to uh, NLP. Can you explain what is the bracket CLS and FCC? I will, I will get to that momentarily. Uh, those are to do with how BERT looks at the model itself. So BERT is able to look at this token, these tokens in this. Yes? Yes. Oh, yes. Okay, yes. So, in the, in the olden days of three or four years ago, um, <laughs> what we would do was we would split, pre-tokenize the words based on something like, if it's English, we would just use spaces and punctuation. If it's other languages, we have to be more careful. For example, Chinese writing, we have to actually build a tokenizer that's statistical of its own, uh, its own, uh, in its own regard. Uh, English is a nice language, it's fairly morphologically simple, we don't do a lot to our words, we just kind of leave them alone and rely on order to deal with them. Uh, so always caveat, other languages can be harder, your mileage may vary, not, not, not available where not applicable. Um, but we have this problem, if we hadn't seen a word before, if that complete word did not exist in our database, we didn't have a reference for it. So we either had to infer it by trying to like, magic up some estimate of where it might be, or we had to like initiate it completely uh, um, uh, neutrally, so we didn't know what the word meant, we just had to treat it as an unknown token, or we had to figure something else out. And what we've done here is, instead of doing that, what BERT does is it has a vocabulary of about 30,000 symbols, including all the letters and the numbers. So at worst, it can break a word down into very small individual pieces. And then because the transformer is such a powerful model, it can reconstruct those things. So now you see that you are, uh, it recognized I can't install and 2019, all of those things came in as, as single tokens. It's seen those tokens before, but rev it, it's split into two. It's split into rev, which it had seen before, and a second subword token for IT with the double hash, meaning that it's a it's suffix. Because it's not an English word. Because it's not an English word, and it's one it hasn't seen before. So there are some, not what I would call non-English words in the corpus because in the database because of the way the corpus is trained. So here's the magic part. What we do is we take this giant transformer model and we train it on hundreds of gigabytes of data over two specific objectives. We do what's called multi-objective training. And the first thing that we do is we mask words. So we say all attention is all you and then we give BERT a masked token and it has to guess what word should be there. 80% of the time, um, we just mask it with that mask token. 10% of the time, we mask it with a random word, and 10% of the time, we mask it with the original word. The details of why you do that are in the paper, and they're very clearly explained, but it basically comes down to stopping the model from overfitting on the mask symbol. Second thing we do is we take that same model, and then we train it again. And this time, you can see I have these CLS and SEP things. What I'm interested in here is, OK, Bert, you've learned about words. Now I want to teach you about sentences and about structures beyond individual words. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to show you two sentences and you're going to tell me if they're related to each other, if this is the sentence that comes after the one before. And I hopefully most of you have identified that this is probably not 
uh, uh, a co coherent sequence, so BERT should reject this. 50% of the time I'm going to show you real pairs, 50% of the time I'm going to show you fake pairs. And when we come out of this, we get a model, we get a language model that can run from half a billion to, as of yesterday, 17 billion parameters. So Microsoft just trained a 17 billion parameter transformer, um, which doesn't fit on anything as far as I can see. It's like very heavily. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what we're interested in at this point is um, the perplexity of the model. How clear is the model on every word it sees? How much does it, can it say, I see Revit, I know what that means. I see um, angry, I have a pretty good idea of what that means. I'm, I know with reasonable certainty what's going on. So this multi-objective training, this self-supervised training as we call it, uh, I think one of the teams in a uh, university in Canada trained uh, a $1.5 billion model uh, on an Amazon account and it cost them about $25,000. Uh, you do not have to do that. Uh, where is our cost sensitive friend in the audience? <laughs> uh, there you are. You, wouldn't, you get this for free. So 90% of the performance of the NLP model that you're going to be using comes from the transformer and comes from this pre-built model that you get off the internet. But if you want to train for your data, then can you do it on your machine? Or you I will explain that momentarily. <laughs> um, so you do not have to train this large model. You download this from the internet. You can pick, uh, using the hugging face transformers, you can pick one of, I think, 11 architectures right now. And uh, you can even create Franken models where you take one piece of an architecture and connect it to another piece of an architecture. So you have full range to do anything you like to abuse the data to as much as you wish. Once you have that downloaded, then what you do is you can fine tune it. So if you're like us, if you're Autodesk, you have a large amount of uh, terminology that's use specific. You have a large amount of situations where, for example, our meaning of the word line is not what is used in most cases because we're normally talking about drawings, not like cues in a shop. Um, in that situation, you can one time fine tune your model. This is a kind of an overnight process most of the time. It's very straightforward. You're just doing the same thing as we did before, multi-objective training. We're just continuing the training with a different corpus. Once that's done, to actually use the transformer, what we do is we tell the transformer we want to do text classification, or we want to do language generation, or we want to do sentence similarity measurement, or any of the uh, major NLP objectives that we want and we feed it some data to train it. This is very cheap to do. This is a couple of hours of work to do. And you get extremely high performance from this straight off the box. On your computer? Uh, I wouldn't do it on my computer because I have a Mac. But uh, we do it on SageMaker. And I will talk about how we do it on SageMaker right now. Uh, I think it's efficient, most efficient to do it on something like SageMaker because then I don't have to invest in, uh, in any sort of uh, uh, NVIDIA cards. Uh, instead, I can just spend that money on Amazon Prime. <laughs> so, how does this work in process? We decide on our base model. Am I speaking English? Do I want to use BERT? Do I care about case? Uh, and then I take this code from the Hugging Face Transformers glue example, and I do a small amount of, of monkeying with it. Uh, specifically, we will talk about what you need to do in a moment. And then we add our data to S3. We put our pre-trained model on a cloud storage area. We put our training data on there. And we put any other information that we need. And we change the data loader to, to, to those reference points. And because of the way SageMaker works, this is all nice and transparent. It's as though it were already a local file. It's very easy to do. And it means that you can put that there. And our team has one place we can put it. And everyone who wants to train their own BERT model can pull that data, pull that pre-trained model very easily. Um, tens of millions of documents. Yeah, that's the but you can, uh, that's only for the fine tuning. Yes, I know. Because yeah. if you're for fine tuning, your data is much more efficient. Yeah, uh, depending on your tokens. So there are some situations where you do want to do that. For example, actually, this is a good tip that I forgot to put in a slide. Uh, BERT reserves a certain number of tokens in its, in its uh, tokenizer as unused tokens. And they are given an index, but they don't have any training associated with them. If you have funky reason, if you have reasons to add symbols to your text, um, one example of what was done with this was to do style control. Um, you can use those reserved keywords to do that and pre-train, and then you fine tune on. It doesn't need to be a huge corpus, but that'll allow you to add a, st a token to control, for example, style generation. So, um, pro tip. Um, <coughs> So fine tuning a transformer. This is uh, Python code, and mostly this is SageMaker code. So SageMaker provides an interface 
what they call a PyTorch estimator. I'm not going to explain any of that because uh, that would be stealing the limelight. But the important point here is that we give it a, a type of an instance. So this is a P38X large, which is a GPU-based instance. We tell it that we just want to uh, use a certain number of hyperparameters that I'll talk about in a second. And the critical thing here is because of the way PyTorch is structured and because of the way uh, Hugging Face have built their transformers library, there is a two-line um, requirements.txt that installs all your, your prerequisites. And for me, that is the best thing about this whole environment. I no longer have to mess with CUDA. CUDA. I no longer have to do any sort of X configuration or figure out why my laptop is melted through the desk or any of those sorts of things. I just go import transformers and I say, and I use TQDM because I want to see a pretty looking progress bar. And then I just pass it a set of Piper parameters. So in this case, we specify the baseline model that we are going to use. In this case, it's BERT based on CASED, <coughs> excuse me, which is uh, an English language BERT model that um, is a relatively small model. It's only got, I think, I forget the numbers, but it's a relatively small model. And it is uncased, which means we've lowercased all the text. That works in English, it doesn't work in German, but that doesn't matter because you're not using this model for German. We tell it what labels we want. These are just our internal way of labeling different types of support cases. And then we tell it that we're using lowercase because otherwise it'll get very confused. And then what I want to talk about next is these things here. So the max sequence length and the train batch size. Um, remember that I said that we have this attention layer where we're looking at uh, forwards and backwards across a sentence, a set of these subword tokens. There is a problem here. Can anyone tell me what that problem might be? Hmm? Yes, exactly. I don't, people don't talk in a very convenient 512 segment sequence. Uh, and what happens is you either have to pad out the short ones or you, you run over the sentence at the end. Now, there is a paper called Reformer, which has extended that size, they claim, up to 50,000 tokens, which allows the model to take an entire novella or short book into it, into it once. Uh, still very experimental, but very cool if working. Uh, BERT allows you up to 512, but you can optimize. If you don't think your sequences are going to be especially long, if you don't think you're going to get a lot of essays, then you can just use, you can shorten that, that speeds up the training. That is in bytes, what is that? It's in subword tokens. Okay. So you, it's a little bit unpredictable for that reason because you don't know how it's going to split the words. So you may have to do a little bit of engineering if that comes up. But generally, if you think you're getting towards that limit, that 512 limit, you will have to do a little bit of statistical analysis. Batch sizes are as you expect. Keep it small though because BERT is very memory hungry and the other transformers are even worse. Learning rates as normal. Relatively small numbers of epochs. Between two and eight epochs tends to work pretty well. You can go on forever if you were, wish. I'm sure someone here will put their hand up and say I did 700 epochs on BERT and got amazing results. Great, we didn't need to. Uh, and then it uses this learning rates as before. So the nice thing is most of the training is the stuff you're familiar with. It uses Atom, it uses the, the standard ways of, of uh, or organizing. Um, my colleague who uh, did a lot of the work on this code insisted on using seed 55. I always want to use 42, but um, <laughs> I can't do everything. Uh, and then all we have to do is load the model. So we, build a, we load BERT's tokenizer, because as I said, it doesn't use the, the standard tokenization approach. We attach this head, one sec. We attach this head, which is that we say we want to do sequence classification. We want to do text classification in that way. We want to return one of the labels that we showed you before uh, as, our, uh, as our output for the, the, the transformer. Yeah, you had a question? The previous slide. Yeah. What is the local rank minus one? Oh, local rank minus one is for doing distributed training, I think. Yes. Minus one means? Uh, don't worry about it. No, I mean, I mean, telling it not to worry about it. Don't do local ranks. Uh, you can do fully distributed training on SageMaker. We're not doing it in this context, but yes. We're, we're, we're going to cover a different way of doing that in the next session. Sweet. So the better way of, uh, my whole talk is over. You can just. <laughs> 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 no, I'm only joking. OK. Uh, then we just uh, load the pre-existing model. We give it the labels, and we pre-train the model. Then we just customize it. We download the vocabulary and go from there. In training, um, this is one of the interesting things about um, transformers is there's a couple of different ways to start the training because transformers, one of the tips that I will give you about them is that they can just fail. They just sometimes get lost early and kind of crap out. 
And what you can do is you can try a couple of different ways to, to use a higher or lower learning, uh, learning rate and to alter the learning rate cycl cyclically at the start. Uh, so you use this linear scheduler. In this case, we're reproducing the configuration from the paper, so we have fixed lengths, but you can do all sorts of stuff around proportional or um, uh, nonlinear uh, optimization as you see fit, and you can decide whether or not you want to have Adam correct your bias. Uh, nice thing about this is this later generation of code um, uses the PyTorch Atom and doesn't use a bunch of other stuff that was very custom. So do all of that. You get yourself a state-of-the-art um, text classification tool. You can do all sorts of stuff with that. You can do anything you want around text classification. Margin, attach a different head, and you can do sentence similarity and everything else. So coming to the end, apologies for the slightly long uh, talk. How do we do this with SageMaker? Well, there are a couple of things that we think make SageMaker a good way to do this. First, we can share all our data on a big shared drive. Second, we use notebooks a lot of the time. The SageMaker notebook is essentially a Jupyter notebook, which means that it's a lot more familiar for a lot of our people. You can use the existing libraries. You can pull that sort of stuff in. It's easy to, to manage that sort of stuff. With NLP, you did a lot of pre-processing on your data set, so we want to keep those intermediary data sets somewhere that's easily available. We do frequent backups because of this shared drive nature. And because of the way that training works, uh, you just pay for the GPU instance as long as it's actually training, so you don't have to worry about leaving it on overnight and bankrupting your company. <laughs> what sort of stuff do we share? Well, we share all sorts of things, and as I mentioned before. Uh, very Second last slide. Um, I mentioned all of these embedding things. One of the things that we also do is we use a different architecture called um, ULM fit to generate stable embeddings for words. This allows us to just say, here's a piece of text, give me back a representation that I can manipulate for similarity. I can do cosine similarity, I can put this into a tree, I can do anything I like with it that allows me to have semantic similarity for my content. And I, uh, we use a, a model service for this where we just have an endpoint that you can fire any amount of text at and get back an embedding. Super, uh, super powerful because it allows you to rapidly accelerate the kind of analysis you might want to do in NLP because you're immediately into something differentiable when you use it. So. Final slide. We like notebooks. Sharing is much more about uh, techniques. It's about understanding. It's about how you process the text as well as the code and the data. And we absolutely love the PyTorch community. We actually also love the AWS people. They've been extremely helpful to us in talking us off cliff edges when we try and do stupid things with transformers. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, just make some small links that are worth looking at. One, I that first one is a way of visualizing attention if you want to learn how attention works. Second one is all the models that are available for BERT. Start there if you want to try out transformers. BERT in more depth by a much more knowledgeable person is the next link. And then the last one is called um, NLP has its image net moment and it explains why transfer learning is so important uh, to the NLP community and how it changed everything. Uh, my uh, LinkedIn is here. Feel free to add me and uh, hopefully not spam me, but I'm happy to continue the conversation offline. Thank you very much. So we have time for a few questions. If you Great. Have. Yes. I will answer no Who to all of them. The yes. Uh, it help if you have the I know. <laughs> I jumped the gun. <laughs> so uh, I have a few questions. One is uh, around Yes. Um, I, I, I was confused because uh, what you, you talked about going through this and backwards and you got uh, uh, yes. a particular yes. word yeah, so. and it's related to something else, but then you, then you talk about uh, looking for it, you know, jumping it up right you, and okay. from October 10th. Yeah. Uh, so let me explain in a little bit more of a coherent way. Um, and also show my slides. So, uh, yes, um, so uh, transformers look at all the symbols simultaneously. They do not, um, they don't look in sequence. They just look at all 512, up to 512 sequences at once. They just, it's as though you were doing that speed reading thing where you're supposed to look back and look at the whole thing at once, okay? But what they understand is, what we do is we project those attention relationships backwards and forwards. So all the words, we look at the interaction of all the tokens with all the other tokens in the sentence at once. And bidirectional encoding is what BERT sort of stands for, and that's because it does that in both directions. So that's the part of it. Like, 
conceptually you can think of it as reading forwards and backwards, but what it's actually just doing is projecting the influence of the of all of the words simultaneously onto all the other ones. Uh, yes, so we encode position as well in BERT. Um, yeah, it's another layer. And I, I should have, so I didn't want to get into too much detail about that, but yes, you encode, to, you encode position as well. Yes. So actually, this is a different architecture. I kind of ran too long on the first half of the talk. But uh, same idea. I give it a piece of text. I get back a fixed length embedding that is a kind of a, 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 math ma a, a numerical vector that represents the meaning of that sentence based on, all of, based on all of this stuff that we've learned. Yeah, and it's a slightly different architecture. Question one is, could you explain how do you deploy this, this, this basic model that the infrastructure look like? Yes. And you're actually, you know, fixing customers' problems and figuring it out. The second question is, do you have any thoughts on the state of energy right now? Because uh, uh, I read what GPT-2 produced, and like the sentences made sense, but as I started to read more and more, like the whole story did not make sense. Gotcha. What, what is happening there? What okay, so uh, for the first part of the question, we serve BERT models with EC2 instances with a flask over it. You can also use SageMaker endpoint hosting if you desire. Uh, they work out to be kind of similar. We use the EC2 for infrastructural reasons. But um, essentially, you, just have a, you can just have flask wrapping it, or you can write it in any fashion that you wish like that, and then just write the, the back end as you see fit. So it's very straightforward to, to, to lay out. Uh, and there's tons of optimization you can do there. Quantization in natural language models is a big thing. Um, people have taken BERT down to 8-bit and worked. it's worked pretty well, so you can do a lot to kind of speed things up. You can also do distillation where you train a smaller model from a bigger one. Where is machine learning going? I don't know. <laughs> um, we've had a big part, we've had like in the last, since 2013, we have had four major like generations of machine learning in natural language processing that have made huge strides forward. Um, so the question is, are we in a stable phase now where we're just going to keep building bigger models, or are we going to learn something new along the way? Um, we need to start thinking about how we can encode things like dependency, things like more to do with the grammar, all of those sorts of things, into how the language works. And there is interest in doing those sorts of things. There was a paper released last week on doing um, sequence-only parsing of sentences, which is very intriguing because if neural supremacy appears in parsing, we have an interesting situation where it can now do grammatical understanding in a little bit more of a meaningful way than before. Linguists in the room don't shoot me. That's a kind of a very broad way of saying that, but it's interesting nonetheless. So we need to get beyond that. Second thing is things like the reformer. Like what do you get when you can put an entire uh, novel rather than just a sentence or rather than just a, an arbitrary 512 character? Uh, no, um, I can't remember who to... It's DeepMind. DeepMind did the reformer. Yeah. So that stuff, all super interesting. Um, but that's just making it bigger and bigger. No, no, no. Reformer is very different. Like, reformer is structured differently. The Microsoft one is making it bigger and bigger. But even then, it's an interesting achievement because you have to slice the model up in very specific ways. Um, but we have probably reached the limits. Like, 17 billion parameters is more the parameters than anyone really needs, I think. Um, there are initiatives in trying to do... Um, control generation. So one of the open questions is, humans aren't, you can imagine that GPT-2 is a bit like someone who's been struck on the head and is babbling, right? It just kind of talks about the most probable sentence it's seen conditioned on what it's seen before. But it doesn't have any coherent right. mental model that it's reflecting. Right. So the question is, how do we go from, say, a script or say a description of the environment to a coherent description of that environment? So caption generation, storyline generation, all those tasks are leading in that direction about how do we do that sort of thing. If we can get that done, then we're in a great place. I just have one last kind of follow-up question, right? So uh, I was in 2015 at the MNP conference, and so Yosha Benjik and all of it, and uh, computational linguists and the audience basically said, like, should we just all retire? Is deep learning taking over? Right, and so let's say you're in a startup and you need to solve questions of yours, right? Like, basically, you just give the recipe, 
You don't need to study traditional linguistics. You just, you know, you can take this and solve a problem. Do you need to read money in Jurovsky book? Is it obsolete? Like, if you want to solve, like, what kind of problems are still requiring traditional linguistics and grammars and, you know, get the degree? And, like, can you get by and do most of the sort of jobs and the practice with learning it from, from books? Chris Manning is much too near for me to say that he's obsolete. Um, I, no, the answer to which tasks need linguists is all of them. The question is at what point do you need to, in, uh, to bring them in. So I think that what's important about this sort of technology is that we're benefiting from an enormous amount of detailed work by the whole computational linguistics community on developing something that is uh, a way of getting over the sort of stuff that were not really problems that were, they were problems of amount of data available and problems of how to train models stably and problems of understanding that sort of stuff. So you get further for free, but you always need experts in the end. And the moment you can afford to hire them, you should be hiring them because they will fix things better. And very often, the other option is that you don't need this massive model and like these sorts of things. There are very often situations where you will find that someone can tell you something about your, your data and your language that you don't need to worry about this. So this is a way of doing things if you've already decided you need to operationalize. Text classification is your answer, but it is not the answer to the problem, I have language and I need to fix it. Mm -hmm. So uh, computational linguistics is a, and linguistics in general is an immensely important field. And I should also mention other super important aspect this is underrepresented languages, dialects, vari lo regional variations, variations in script, cultural variations, bias, all that sort of stuff is wholly uncovered in this talk, which makes this talk radioactive. But I didn't have time to talk about it. I'm already way over time. Suffice to say, like, there's all sorts of language encoding that we're embedding here that's biased, that is a bad thing, and you need to think about all that. Thank you, Alex. Let's, let's Thank you very much.